please join me in welcoming Islam Hassan. Hello, everyone. Before I start, I'd like to thank Professor Kamrava, who I've learned a great deal from, both as a student, as a member of my thesis committee, as a colleague, and as a scholar of Middle Eastern studies. As you all know, the United Arab Emirates, or the UAE, has heavily engaged itself over the past few years in establishing military bases and acquiring operational and management rights over ports and economic zones in and around the Red Sea. This foray into the Red Sea, one of the most global shop, uh, shipping lanes, was coupled by a significant naval military presence of, uh, in the Gulf of Aden and the Bab el-Mandab Strait, as well as the presence of private Emirati security companies to provide anti-piracy operations and provide protections protection for UAE ships. These feverish endeavors reflect a larger change in the foreign policy of the UAE that has been evolving over the past decade. The UAE's heavy investment with cash and guns in the Red Sea region included supplying economic aid, building ports, providing maritime services, and establishing military and naval uh, bases in various spots in and around the region. In order to understand this peculiar policy, one ought first to explore six main factors that led in the first place to the overall changes in the country's foreign policy. These include the rise of new leadership to power in 2004, the massive economic wealth the country has generated over the past decade or so, the faltering of traditional regional pillars of influence, the ensuing vacuum in the regional order, the intense rivalry with Qatar, and the rise of Islamist militant groups in the Middle East and North and East Africa. All these factors have contributed to the vast change in the foreign policy of the UAE, which not only included a change in the means used to achieve foreign policy goals, but also in the identification of pressing problems and goals. In this dialogue, I argue that in order to maintain domestic stability in a volatile region, secure its trade, and expand its regional influence, the UAE has, following the death of Sheikh Zayed, adopted a more active and assertive foreign policy, seeking more influence through maintaining a strong economic and military presence in the Red Sea, East Africa, and the Horn of Africa. I'll start my talk with a discussion on what I really mean by foreign policy change. I will then explain why in their pursuit of security and influence, the traditionally neglected region of the Red Sea and East Africa has attracted the attention of the new UAE leadership. I'll then explore the various Emirati activities in the Red Sea and East Africa and explore the effect of regional dynamics, particularly the Arab Spring and the relationship with the United States on the reformulation of Emirati foreign policy. Ladies and gentlemen, change is a fundamental aspect of foreign policy. In analyzing Emirati foreign policy, my talk is premised on the belief that three levels of analysis should be considered simultaneously, including regional and international effects, domestic influences, um, and the role of leadership. It therefore assumes that foreign policy change comes about as a result of the convergence of three sources of change. Changes in the domestic and international environment, a change in the political leadership, that runs foreign affairs, and an element of external crisis that stimulates or accelerates change. Other sources of change, such as bureaucratic politics and advocacy groups, uh, are excluded because the foreign policy decision-making process in the UAE is highly centralized. Since its establishment more than four decades ago, the country's foreign policy has been run by the man at the helm of the state, with the help of at most few individuals. These changes on the domestic, regional, international levels are subsequently digested and interpreted through the convictions, personality, and worldviews of the principal foreign policy decision maker. If he believes that these changes create a new situation, posing itself either as a threat or an opportunity, or both, then foreign policy change is to be expected. 
This is because developments on these three levels can lead to the birth of new paradigms of thinking, including the reconceptualization of new threats, the shuffling of foreign policy objectives, and the inception of, an, of new foreign policy strategies and plans of action. In measuring a sort of a, the level of change in foreign policy, one can argue that there are four different degrees of foreign policy change. The first is adjustment changes, in which minor changes resulting from a change in the level of effort thrust into a policy. The second level is program changes, in which foreign policy goals remain unchanged, but changes occur in the means or methods used to address a problem. The third level is problem or goal changes, in which a change occurs in the identification of problems and goals. And finally, there's a change in international orientation, in which an entire restructuring in the state's orientation towards world politics occur. In today's discussion, I will demonstrate that the change in UAE's foreign policy fits the third level of change, entailing a change not only in means and methods, but also in the identification of goals and problems. This raises a question, why the Red Sea and East Africa has attracted the new leadership in the UAE? A magnet that attracts power, the Red Sea has historically been an arena of competition among international forces because it provides a strategic link between Europe, Africa, and Asia, the Egyptians, Greeks, Persians, Arabs, and Romans and in the 19th and early 20th century, the British, French, Russians, and Germans. And in the Cold War era, the Americans and the Soviets all vied for the dominance of the Red Sea, its lateral and entrances. In the current scheme of things, it's the US and China, and interestingly, a number of regional powers, such as Turkey, Israel, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and the UAE, that are scrambling for influence in the region. In order to understand the UAE's foreign policy, one has to step back and take into account the structure of the federation. The UAE is made up of seven emirates, of which Abu Dhabi and Dubai stand out as the key determinants of the country's political and economic policies. For the past decade, Abu Dhabi has been more concerned with regional politics, while Dubai has been directing its resources towards economic development. The UAE's strong presence in the Red Sea and uh, East Africa serves both Abu Dhabi's political regional interests and Dubai's economic and trade interests. In other words, the UAE has taken a special interest in the Red Sea region for two main reasons, economic and geopolitical. First, the Red Sea is the global sea line through which the West's huge hydrocarbon imports uh, are transported and traded goods between Europe and the thriving Asian market are shipped. It's estimated that through the Red Sea, over 10% of global trade passes, and over 30% of, of the world's container volume flows. The Red Sea has two choke points, the Suez Canal in the north and the Bab el-Mandeb Strait in the south, through which 3.9 and 4.8 million barrels of oil passed every day in 2017. This makes the Red Sea a significant sea line for shipping oil, the lifeline of UAE's economy. Furthermore, the importance of the economies of the Red Sea countries has been rising in recent years and is expected to continue rising in the future. It's estimated that the population of the countries that have a coastline on the Red Sea will rise from around 306.5 million in 2015 to 551 million in 2050 and the GDP uh, of their economies to triple from $1.8 trillion to $6.1 trillion. And their trade with the outside world to increase from $881 million to $4.7 trillion. Such an enormous, enor enormous growth makes the Red Sea region an attractive market for the UAE, which owns a logistics industry worth $27 billion and which continually searches for increased political influence and foreign investment opportunities. The Red Sea, moreover, is currently one of the main trade routes for around 35% of the UAE's exports and 52% of its imports. 
So in addition to benefiting from the operations of ports and the provision, provision of maritime services along the route, the UE tries to maintain a significant military and naval presence in the region to secure the flow of its imports and exports and to thwart any attempt by rivals to take trade away from its strategic Jabal Ali port, the ninth busiest port in the world. Unsurprisingly, the UAE's economic aid to East African countries increased 20-fold between 2011 and 2013. No doubt, the UAE's direct participation in the Yemen war has added a political incentive for its interest in the region. Second, the overarching concern about the rise of Islamism in the region has been another motive. One significant attribute of the current foreign policy of the UAE is its ardent fight against ideologies, primarily Islamist ideologies, and its promotion of liberal secular governance. A number of militant Islamist groups have in recent years popped up in several East African countries, especially Somalia, Sudan, Eritrea, and Tanzania, causing instability in both East and North Africa. The rise of Islamists in East Africa and their reported ties to ISIS has motivated the UAE to build stronger ties with local governments, support indigenous rival militant groups, and station active military forces in the region. All this amounts to an added layer of protection from the threat of militant Islamists, especially in light of a recent increase in, uh, in mentioning the UAE as a potential target in their propaganda. The UAE's foreign minister, Abdullah bin Zayed, put it bluntly, and I quote, as groups like Daesh develop ties to criminal networks and arms networks like Al-Shabaab, it's essential that we prevent them from expanding their operations into the sea and threaten vital channels such as the, Str the Strait of Hormuz, the Red Sea, Bab al-Mandab, and the Gulf of Aden. Then, what did the UAE do in order to uh, tackle such an, I mean, to be attracted in the region, what sort of activities did the UAE start uh, in that part of the world? The UAE's efforts in the Red Sea have included establishing military bases, constructing and running ports, and providing maritime services. The UAE operates today seaports in six of the seven countries in the Red Sea. Egypt, Djibouti, Somalia, Yemen, uh, Saudi Arabia, and Eritrea with the exception of Djibouti that just recently revoked its contract with Dubai World Ports. And the UAE also runs military bases in at least three countries, Yemen, Eritrea, and Somaliland, besides stationing troops in Egypt in Mohammed Naguib's military base. The UAE's na naval and military presence in the region includes a plan to set up a base for military training in the Yemeni island of Sukutra, a naval presence in two islands in Bab el-Mandab Strait, the opening of a training center in Mogadishu, and the establishment of two military bases in Barbara, the largest port in Somaliland, a self-declared state that seeks autonomy from Somalia, and in Eritrea's Asab. Economically, the focus of the UAE has been on investment opportunities, new markets, logistics, and ports. As the chairman and CEO of DP World, uh, Sultan Ahmed bin Sulaim pointed out, Trade and logistics infrastructure are key pillars in diversifying economies, supported by technology and automation. In this regard, we see that in Egypt, the UAE began in 2008 its efforts by investing in Ain al-Sukhna port, crucial for being the closest port to the Egyptian capital, Cairo. Over the following years, Dubai Ports World, a company that operates maritime services and marine terminals predominantly owned and run by the UAE government, establish a joint development company with the Suez Canal Zone uh, that would carry on development plans for Ain al-Sukhna port, East Port Said port, West Port Said port, and the regions of Kantara West, East Ismailia, Adabiya, Al-Tur, and Al-Arish. Although the Suez Canal Economic Zone has the majority of shares, 51%, DPW has managing rights over the zone. In other words, DPW would be managing the strategic Suez Canal zone from Port Said up north to Ain al-Sukhna in the south. In Djibouti, DPW won a 20-year concession from the government to operate the port of Djibouti in 2000. This led to the establishment of a joint venture in 2006 with the Djibouti government to invest in the Dorella container terminal. 
and a plant zone in, in, uh, in the area. DPW and the Dubai-owned P&O ports also won concessions to operate two ports in the Gulf of Aden, Berbera port and Busasu port. In Yemen, DPW signed a contract in 2008 to operate the port of Aden, but the company suspended its operations in 2012 after Yemen's anti-corruption commission accused DPW for failure to fulfill its contractual investment obligations. However, in 2015, the Saudi-led military coalition, to which the UAE armed forces have contributed, seized the port of Aden from the Houthi rebels and took control over the flow of goods and aid in it. Also in Yemen, the Emirati forces captured in April 2016 the ports of Muqalla and Shihr. A few months earlier, it occupied two strategically located islands in Bab al-Mandab Strait, through which around 4 million barrels of oil pass every day. In early 2017, Emirati troops seized the ports of Mocha and are now setting their sight on the port of Hodeida, the largest Yemeni port and the country's only major port the UAE has not yet controlled. This explains why the Saudi-led coalition and its local Yemeni allies are currently launching a push toward Hodeida to capture it from the Houthi rebels. The UAE has also seized the Sukutra Island, located in the Arabian Sea, south of the Yemeni mainland, uh, and is planning to use it as a base for military training. Lastly, DPW won concession from the Saudi government to operate the South Container Terminal at the Jeddah Islamic port. And in uh, 2017, it signed a contract with the, with the Saudi government to develop the Jeddah Islamic port as a whole as part of the NEO mega project. And in the Mediterranean, the UAE has managed to win concessions to, to operate and provide marine services at the port of Limassol in Cyprus, known to be the busiest transit uh, port uh, for trade going between Europe, Africa, Asia, and Australia. Despite developing over the years a large and well-trained foreign affairs bureaucracy, foreign policy making in the UAE is still run in the same fashion it has been since its genesis. In a nutshell, running of foreign affairs lies in the hand of uh, the ruler, the president of the federation, who is committed to achieving consensus among the rulers of the other six emirates. The main responsibility of the bureaucracy in this prince state is to execute policies already designed by the ruler rather than propose policies or take initiatives. As Professor Kamava argues in his book, Qatar Small State Big Politics, in individuals at the helm of this, of this type of states have not just replaced institutions, they have become institutions. This modus vivendi, not unusual in Arab states, means that major shifts in foreign policy usually follow a change in uh, top leadership. A major shift in the foreign policy of the UAE took place after the death of Sheikh Zayed in 2004, who's, no, who's the, uh, the founding father of the Federation. During the long years of Sheikh Zayed's rule from 1971 to 2004, UAE's foreign policy was more idealistic than realistic, more reactive than proactive. It tended to toe the line of the GCC and Arab countries, develop amicable relations with most world countries, develop, uh, uh, and avoided entanglement in, in the quarrels and rivalries of other states, focused on diplomacy and mediation to solve regional disputes, and gave top priority to the Palestinian question. Obviously, during the early precarious years of the Federation, Zayed had to contend with the ordinary challenges of state formation. He realized that in order for the Federation to survive, let alone flourish, he has to direct his efforts and resources to two main goals, maintaining the unity of the UAE and seeking regional and international recognition. After getting elected as a president of the Federation in 1971, Sheikh Zayed's main focus was to ensure the sustainability of the Union. Further, Iran's occupation of three Emirati islands in the same year meant that the UAE was put on test from the first day of its formation. To obtain regional international recognition, Zayed avoided confrontations with neighboring countries, and more than that, followed the stream in the Arab and Muslim worlds. In a statement summarizing his foreign policy views, Sheikh Zayed said, and I quote, we in the Gulf build our foreign policy in two parallel lines. Our relationship with Arab and Islamic countries is a brotherly relationship within the Islamic context, and we deal with these countries in the way as brothers deal with each other. Our second line deals with non-Islamic countries on purely, uh, uh, on purely humane criteria, 
We treat them as humans, respect them as humans, as much as they have friendship and kindness for us. Hence, generally speaking, the foreign policy of the UAE was pan-Arabist at, at the zenith of pan-Arabism in the 1970s, turned slightly pan-Islamist in the heyday of pan-Islamism in the 80s, and then became increasingly pragmatic in the decades that saw the decline of ideologies, the 1990s and thereafter. This quiet and consensually reactionary foreign policy was discarded after the rise of Sheikh Khalifa bin Zayed and Mohammed bin Zayed, often referred to as MBZ, to power in 2004. By the time this new generation came to power, the UAE was no longer the small and vulnerable union it was in 1971. By the early 2000s, the UAE was politically deep-rooted, its economy became a regional powerhouse, and the country's socioeconomic outlook began to be seen as a model to be emulated by other countries in the region and beyond. The challenges of state building were gone and replaced by ambitions for establishing a modern secular state, which is geared towards economic liberalization at home and expanded influence in the region. Because of the frail health of Sheikh Khalifa, MBZ became the de facto ruler by 2014. On the personal level, the overly ambitious MB MBZ has a regional and international outlook that is conspicuously different from his reserved father. He tends to be more pragmatic, realistic, and confrontational in dealing with regional challenges. The UE under his leadership followed an independent, confident, and initiative-based foreign policy that unlike other small states that only guard their home turf, goes beyond the country's natural strategic realm and seeks a foothold in faraway regions. So rather than merely focusing on diplomacy, mediation, dialogue, and foreign aid, which Sheikh Zayed used as tools to win regional international recognition, the new leadership has sought influence through military engagement, massive foreign direct investments internationally, and military and naval presence beyond the country's vicinity, particularly in the Red Sea, East Africa, Yemen, and Libya. No less significantly, the UAE's economy has in the same years become more robust than ever before, thanks to the massive influx of petrodollars following the upsurge of oil prices from $22 per barrel, per barrel in 2002 to $147 in 2008. The country's GDP has more than doubled since the new leadership came to power. It amounted to $150 billion in 2004, then increased in 2017 to around $407 billion. And it is estimated to reach around $485 billion by 2020. Given the combination of having a sizable economy and a small population, which was estimated in 2016 at 9.2 million, out of which uh, local Emiratis make, 15%, make up 15%, the UAE has one of the highest per capita incomes in the world. In 2017, the GDP per capita stood at about $68.2,000, the third highest in the Arab world after Qatar and Kuwait. Although, the oil, although oil and gas sector has historically constituted the biggest share of the country's exports, the UAE's recent diversification efforts contributed to a significant drop in the share of natural resources in the country's GDP. This reached only 30% in 2017. Flush with cash and high on ambition and bravado, the UAE sought to become a major regional power. Over the decade that followed the death of Sheikh Zayed, the UAE's military expenditures increased by about 234%. Today, the UAE is frequently described as Little Sparta for its small-sized, yet efficient, and well-equipped military force. The Emirati army is made up of roughly 65.4 thousand active troops, both nationals and mercenaries. However, its recent fighting experience in Yemen and Libya made it a battle-hardened army. The UAE has also imposed compulsory military conscription on all Emirati men aged between 18 and 30 in 2014. The country's new leadership has made sure to endow its army with state-of-the-art weaponry and training. Its military acquisitions budget doubled between 2009 and 2015. In 2016, Emirati military expenditures were estimated at around $21.8 billion. More than that, the U.S. Department of Commerce expects that the UAE defense budget will continue to increase in the coming years, reaching $41 billion by 2025. Not only has the UAE spent massive budgets on modern weaponry systems, but it has also aspired to become a major arms producer in the region. 
To that end, Abu Dhabi has poured massive funds in the Advanced Military Maintenance Repair and over an Overhaul Center, AMROC. MBZ also took part in establishing Abu Dhabi shipbuilding, and in the same vein, the UAE government established Emirates def uh, Defense Industries Company, EDEC. These diplomatic and military efforts were accelerated by two pivotal developments, the crisis moment of the Arab Spring and the rising frictions in the UAE-US relations. A pan-Arab awakening that crossed borders with ease and unleashed deep forces of change. The Arab Spring has sent shock waves throughout uh, the region and the ruling establishments in the Gulf monarchies, representing a typical example of what is dubbed as external shock. The UAE was not totally immune to this vigorous wind of the Arab Spring, which struck the shores of Bahrain and neighboring Oman and echoed inside the UAE itself. Fear of potential spillover effects rose meteorically when following the downfall of bin Ali and Mubarak, local Islamists started to become more politically active. In an unthinkable move, more than 100 activists submitted in March 2011 a petition to the UAE government that demanded an elected parliament that has legislative powers. They called for the reform of the Federal National Council, which, as one signatory told the Wall Street Journal, should be given more authority, including legislative powers as well as powers of accountability. Using a language that is unusual in the politics of the UAE, she added that elections should be the right of every citizen. In the context of the Arab Spring and its vocal calls for reform and equality, the potential Achilles heels of the UAE were the relatively less developed and affluent Northern Emirates, such as Ajman, Sharjah, and Ras al-Khaimah. The grievances produced by the socioeconomic disparities between Abu Dhabi and Dubai, which account for about 90% of the country's GDP on one hand, and these Emirates on the other, carried the potential of transforming into the kind of wide-ranging popular resentment that ignited the, the Arab Spring in other states across the region. The income gap between both groups of Emirates has been growing at alarming rates. In 2007, for instance, the per capita income of Abu Dhabi was six times that of the Emirate of Ajman. In 2011, the GDP per capita of Abu Dhabi and Dubai were estimated at around $110,000 and $41.6,000 respectively, while it was only $22,000 in the other uh, Emirates. Also, the rate of unemployment reached 20% in the nor Northern uh, Emirates. At the time, the national average was only 14%. Particularly worrying to the Emirati leadership was the fact that it was in these Emirates that the local Islah movement, and uh, a historically offshoot of the, Muslim, of the Egyptian uh, Muslim Brotherhood, uh, was most active and influential. To contain this threat, the UAE leadership devised two-pronged policy, unchecked oppression at home and combating Islamists abroad, including in a faraway region such as the Levant, the Mediterranean, the Red Sea, and East Africa. In the meantime, the Arab landscape has changed dramatically after 2011. Some regimes were struck down, others had been engulfed by bloody civil wars, and the Arab-Israeli conflict ceased to be the driving conflict of regional dynamics giving way to other intense conflicts such as the Saudi-Iranian rivalry and the huge, often violent, polarization between Islamist and non-Islamist forces. The reshaping of the region tri triggered a redefinition of states' foreign policy roles and rules of engagement within it. Taking part in a collective security approach that relies on traditional Arab powerhouses was no longer possible. A weakened and inward-looking Egypt, a war-torn Syria, and a divided Iraq created a conspicuous vacuum in the region. Further cracks in the unity of the GCC caused by the divergent threat perceptions of its member states undermined the Council's ability to devise a joint institutionalized security strategy or to act as a united bloc vis-a-vis -vis regional threats. And so the leadership of the UAE attempted to stem the regional disorder, step into the vacuum, and control the nature and pace of regional change either in cooperation with close allies like Saudi Arabia and Egypt, or if necessary, use a go-it-alone approach. The new regional setting was ripe with both new threats and fresh opportunities. 
And on the quest for enhanced security and more influence, the UAE abandoned its foreign policy traditions and embarked on a substantial shift in its foreign policy uh, and the way it runs its foreign affairs. The style of its policy changed from neutrality to intervention, from lethargy to activism, from compromise to intransigence, and from the use of aid and quiet diplomacy to, to distinctively hawkish approach that asserts its presence in regional affairs using military means. The armed forces of the UAE intervened in Bahrain and Libya in 2011, fought ISIS in Syria and Iraq in 2013, and have taken part in the Saudi-led war in Yemen in 2015. This foreign policy change involved not only a change in means, from soft to hard power, but also in goals, seeking security by combating Islamists and pursuing increased regional influence. These two objectives, security and influence, have been dr the driving mot motivations behind the UAE's intervention in the Red Sea and East Africa. The UAE leaders, particularly MBZ, view this region as both a source of threat to regional stability in light of the rising influence there of militant Islamist groups, and as an arena to project Emirati hard power capabilities and to gain more leverage vis-a-vis -vis, uh, other regional powers. Contributing to the UAE's aggressive foreign policy in the Red Sea and East Africa are the deep cracks that have swept the GCC, and consequently, the competition that has taken roots with other Gulf states, including Qatar. Cracks in the long-standing relationship with the United States also fostered the dramatic change in the foreign policy of the UAE. A small state with limited demographic and military capabilities, the UAE relied during the crucial decades of state building and state consolidation for its survival and security almost exclusively on security arrangement uh, with Western states, particularly the US. Three nearly simultaneous developments, however, poisoned the strategic UAE-US alliance. First, the gradual US shift from the Gulf region to the Asia-Pacific region in what is usually termed the pivot to Asia, and Washington's unmistakable efforts to lessen its dependence on Gulf energy supplies made UAE leaders ponder whether the Gulf is still considered to be a priority in Washington's strategic calculations. Then came the US, US administration's tacit embrace of the, of the Arab Spring and the powerful, powerful winds of change it unleashed. President Obama's reluctance to save the Egyptian President Mubarak from the popular uprisings that swept him out of office raised alarm bells in Abu Dhabi. Third, the landmark nuclear deal in 2015 with Iran, a traditional source of threat for the GCC, reinforced to a great extent these concerns and made people in the Gulf talk about a post-US Gulf. These three developments cast doubt on the US commitment to maintaining its long-standing security umbrella over the Gulf region. President Obama's reference in an interview with The Atlantic to free riders that aggravate him further angered Gulf leaders as they thought the statement was aimed at them. Although several dimensions of the security relationship with the US remains intact, the UAE opted for a different approach to secure its interests at home and in the region, without in some cases coordinating or informing the US about its steps. Not only that, but in what is an incredibly unusual behavior of a small state, it dared to make threats to the US. For example, in response to Secretary of State Hillary Clinton's criticism of the GCC for dispatching troops to, uh, to Bahrain in 2011, the UAE threatened to withdraw its forces from the NATO-led campaign against Qaddafi's Libya. As the New York Times then reported, the Emiratis, and I quote, named their price for staying on board. Clinton must issue a statement that would pull back from any criticism of the Bahrain operation. The fallout with Washington, in short, contributed to the strategic reformulation in the foreign policy of the UAE, whose contours began to emerge more clearly after 2011. This has included a disposition toward using military means, the orientation towards other regions, the pursuit of new security partners, and if necessary, the employment of a go-it-alone security approach. The UAE's foray into the Red Sea and East Africa is a direct manifestation of this new foreign policy. In conclusion, the regional competition over the Red Sea and its islands, ports, and straits has intensified in recent years among Turkey, Saudi Arabia, the UAE, and Qatar, and is likely to continue in the foreseeable future. 
the extensive economic and political endeavors of the UAE in the Red Sea and East Africa cannot be understood without understanding the overall changes that foreign policy of the UAE has undergone since 2004, particularly after the events of 2011. The accumulation of vast economic wealth, the fragmentation of Arab politics, the emergence of a vacuum in regional order, the open confrontation with Qatar and the tacit in competition, competition with other claimants to influence in the Arab world, and the rise of Islamist militant groups created a novel situation that has been seen by the UAE's new de facto leader, MBZ, or Mohammed bin Zayed, both as, as a threat and an opportunity. To safeguard its stability and security at home, toward the threat of the burgeoning den of militant Islamists in Somalia, Yemen, and other East African states, secure its trade relations and oil transportation routes, and extend its regional influence, the UAE decided to retain a strong foothold in East Africa and the Red Sea. The control of ports and islands, and the establishment and administration of military bases, training centers, and economic zones in the Red Sea, the Arabian Sea, the Gulf of Aden, and the Bab el Mandeb Strait has offered the UAE the chance to achieve these objectives. As illustrated by this case study, the transformation that has taken place in the foreign policy of the UAE over the past few years has been huge. It has not only, been, uh, it has not only involved a change in foreign policy means, but also in the identification of new foreign policy problems and goals. The UAE now actively pursues influence and stability as its economy and military activities in the Red Sea and East Africa entail. Thank you.